It is early evening when we finally reach Messina after a six-hour drive from Johannesburg. Messina is a bustling town located on South Africa's northern border with Zimbabwe. I'm with my colleague, God knows Nari. So this guy is actually working in government. We are here to meet a government official who's been working with us over the past four months to expose the conditions inside several Zimbabwean prisons. For his own safety, the man we are meeting cannot be identified, and we call him Sydney. All interviews with him are dramatized. You see that what there is. You see him. Okay, so I turn. Yeah. He's just one of several officials and former prisoners who assisted us in getting the visual evidence of the situation inside the prisons. Afterwards, in the privacy of our hotel, we interviewed him after watching disturbing visuals of dying prisoners. It is a very, very horrific situation. I mean, I mean, it, it is bad, believe me, it's bad. People are dying in there, you know, uh, because of diseases and, 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 and overcrowding make diseases even more, 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 more faster. Prisoner 15808 Brian Gumbo wakes up to another bleak day inside Baitbridge Prison on the Zimbabwean side. He's only 26 years old, has severe malnutrition and suffers from TB. He's halfway through his two-year sentence for housebreaking and it seems unlikely that he will make it out alive unless he gets medical attention. His cellmates are all sick and it is likely that they, they were infecting each other. This is their daily routine. You know, they, 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 they live like this every day. You know, eat the very same diet, no medication. This is a courtyard. You know, they, they, they go outside to, to get the, the sunshine, but you can see that they seek. We tried to track down his family and we found that he's originally from Berengwa, the south of Zimbabwe but he has lived at this house in the township uh, associated at Bait Bridge. This woman says Brian's sister, who lived here with him, has left some time last year. Bait Bridge Prison has the capacity to house 500 inmates. Unlike in other prisons, overcrowding is not a problem here because many have died. At this meeting, they are given a chance to raise grievances. This man is concerned about his fellow inmate called Brighton. Brighton Mudadi is married and only 28 years old. He's serving an 18-month sentence for common robbery and is diagnosed with TB. It seems as if his family has abandoned him. Brian, Brighton and their cellmate are eating sadza, a thick porridge made from maize meal. Because they are sick, Brian and the other severely ill prisoners are fed twice a day. But it's only sadza, and there is no meat or vegetables to go with it. You know, at times they get dry boiled maize called amakwaja. 
each prisoner get a scoop of amaguaja maize a day. In the kitchen, an argument starts over a small portion of meat. For many prisoners, this is the only meal of the day, a scoop of plain sadza. This 26-year-old man made it out just in time. He was an awaiting trial prisoner for car theft. He spent a year in jail and was released on free bail when his condition worsened. He says doctors told him that he suffers from pellagra, a disease caused by lack of vitamin B3. A report by the Zimbabwean Association for Crime Prevention and Rehabilitation of the Offender, Zakro, says at least 20 prisoners are dying in the country's 55 prisons every day. Overcrowding has also helped worsen the situation. With 40,000 inmates squashed into facilities meant to house less than half that amount. This is Kami Maximum Prison. It's the second largest prison in the country and is situated in the city of Bulawayo. Special assignments cameras went inside Kami to get an idea of the conditions there. I met this guy, this old man. I thought he was old, only to find out at the later stage. He's not old. He is not old to, 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 to be 40 years. You can see the dark uh, patches in his skin, you see. It's, it's just symptoms of palegra. You know, the disease is killing them inside there. He begged me to, to, to find his family, you know, and he gave me the address of his sister. I tried to find his sister. And when, with, without success, uh, 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 I didn't get anyone in the family. This is a prison hospital. There is no medication and no doctors to attend to the patients. In a damning report released early this year on the funding of the Zimbabwe Prison Service, the Justice Ministry admitted it was battling to feed inmates and to provide medication. HIV-positive inmates also do not have access to life-saving drugs. Zakro found that because of the shortage of drugs, prisoners or their families have to buy their own medicine. But families can hardly afford this. Families arrive for a visit. Most inmates never see their families because they live far away and cannot afford to travel. This couple is here to visit a sick uncle, but are denied entry because they do not have proper ID documents. In this footage, the uncle complains of itching and the lack of food. He is from Wange, near Vic Fall, and was sentenced for stock theft. He is only scheduled for release in 2010. The food brought by the relatives is a lifeline for the lucky ones. But you know, it's also common for the warders to steal food from the prisoners. <laughs> But although Brighton Mudadi's wife and family live in the same town, they never visit him. 
That means low moral support and no proper nutrition to help his body fight the infection. With the help of a fellow inmate, he washes himself and his soiled pants. He is very weak and he says that he is struggling to hold anything in his stomach. Zimbabwean politician Roy Bennett was recently released from prison. We showed him some of our visuals and he spoke about his experiences in Mutari prison, where it took authorities a full day to remove a body from his cell. People in there as well. And what happens with some of the people as well that have got so ill, they go around and they just pick up off the ground and it's filthy. Any little bit of scrap of suds that they pick it up, put it in their mouth, it's incredible. It's incredible. When I got into the prison and was put in the cell, the cell was overcrowded. Uh, there were 12 people in a cell that should hold six. Um, there was only two blankets each. All those blankets were lice-ridden. They hadn't been washed or seen any sort of hygiene for, I would say, years. Um, and then the big shock came when I was let out of the cell in the morning. I was in the D-class, which is dangerous prisoners. Uh, they brought all the other prisoners into the cage that held us. It was like being with people in a, in a prison of war camp. People were absolutely, they were thin. Um, all you could see basically was their eyes, their ribs. You could see right through to their, um, their backbone. And then when I started speaking to people and witnessed firsthand, people were only getting one meal a day. And that meal was being supplied at lunchtime. And it was a, a piece of um, a pup, sort of, which they would scoop with a plate about the size of, of the whole size of your hand. And then the only relish that they had was salt mixed with water. So that's what people were being fed on. Um, there was absolutely no uh, uh, soap. There was no toothpaste or toothbrushes and nothing in the morning and nothing in the evening. Basically, what, what is in those prisons today is a severe travesty of human rights and basically a human rights disaster. Kerry Kay, a human rights activist and the wife of Ian Kay, also a member of parliament, spent three days in Arari police cells. We couldn't even sleep in the cells because there was so much human excreta pouring out of the, the pit that's called the loo and all over the cell floors. So it was disgusting and, you know, it was all dark and, yeah, we, had, we weren't even, we were there for three days. We weren't given a blanket or anything. We just slept on the concrete floor. We tried to clean the one cell and clean the toilets. Um, and as soon as that was clean, everybody else came and used that one. So we just gave up. It's an overwhelming stench of, of, of unclean toilets, of, of excreta. That's there the whole time. Um, you, you, you know, there's no detergents to wash the toilets with. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the toilets, some of them don't flush. So it's a case of pouring water into them. There's a total despair and a total loss of dignity amongst the prisoners that have been there for some time. They honestly believe they're not going to get out and that their fate is sealed because there's no one they can turn to and there's absolutely no justice uh, whatsoever that they're able to, to, to hope for. This old man arrives at Kami prison to identify the body of a family member that has passed away. He received a letter informing him about the death of his grandson. The burial will now take place at the prison cemetery since the family has no money to bury him. There's no transport, so they can't move the bodies. They can't take them into the mortuaries in the town because those mortuaries are full and they won't accept them. On, on three occasions, they managed to get the transport to take the body to the mortuary only to see the body return because the mortuary wouldn't accept the body. So it, it sits in the laundry of the prison until they have to get a plastic body bag out and put it in there because it's, it's burst. Um, the smell, again, you can smell it right throughout the prison. The relatives, because of the economic situation, are too poor or don't have the means to be able to come and collect the bodies. So eventually, those bodies get a corpus burial. The bodies are piling up. And, you know, because of we, we can't find the families, you know, then it becomes our responsibility to bury the bodies. For us to cool the, the room, because there is no mortuary, they, they, it's, not, it's not cold, there are no refrigerators there. We just put sand 
and water, then we pile bodies there, so it becomes a bit cold. When the families come looking for their bodies, they just go inside that room and they, 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 just, they, they have to take other bodies, they, they have to, to, to remove other bodies and look for their specific body. In February, the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation was, was announcing the names of the prisoners who died every night and asking relatives to come and collect them. But with the economic situation at the moment, the relatives are miles away, they haven't got money or couldn't get money, and by the time they would get to the prison to pick up their relatives, they just handed a, a burial order and, um, and what's left of the possessions of the prisoner. And the prisoner's already been buried at a um, graveyard called Mbudzi. What happens in, in one grave, we, 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 we pile three bodies in that grave. This woman's husband is serving a nine-year sentence for stealing meat. She says her husband is very sick and she is praying for him to be released. She has no food to take to him and is barely surviving selling far wood and dried vegetables. <laughs> Last week, the crisis in prison was discussed in Parliament. This was Justice Minister Patrick Chinemasa's response. The economic hardships facing the entire nation are hitting hardest inside prisons, where we have no transport, no logistics, no uniforms, and diets are not being complied with. We've raised this issue with the Ministry of Finance and also partners like the International Community of the Red Cross to seek assistance. On a question of why they don't release inmates who are at death's door, he said, I don't want to be held responsible for rapists released only to rape again. Irene Petraz of the Zimbabwean Lawyers for Human Rights says the situation is out of control. The conditions are so terrible that, that the, prison, uh, the prison service itself can't cope with what is happening. And they've realized the extent of the emergency and they're reaching out to organizations to, for assistance. Uh, but at the same time, I think you need to have a ministry that is concerned with what the conditions are like in prisons and concerned with making a difference. While government is appealing for aid, Western leaders are waiting to see evidence of true power sharing before offering assistance or easing sanctions. The Deputy Justice Minister Jesse Mayome says they acknowledge the problem and are appealing for short-term relief from donors. The Zimbabwe Prison Service is in dire need of assistance. And uh, the priority of the ministry has been and is the sourcing of help, of aid uh, for resources, uh, for the immediate needs are nutrition and also sanitation and even issues like clothing. The man in the wheelchair died a week after my visit. I took a week to go and, and, and look for his sister. When I went back in the prison a week later, I didn't find him, he was dead. And the, unfortunately, I didn't even find the body. A few days later, I revisited Bait Bridge Prison. Brian Gumbo's situation is getting worse. And Brighton Mudadi has also become very weak. His situation is very, very bad. I think we really have got a long way to go. There's a lot of, of violations in terms of the international um, treaties and the regional treaties that we party to, and even under our own constitution and, and our laws. I think what the government has got to appreciate is that uh, being in prison is not, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it's a death sentence. I think there are, there are international standards, international minimum standards that have been put in place uh, that uh, govern the, the, the health 
and, and nutritional status of prisoners. And I think the government has got to abide by those international standards. Despite the hardships, these inmates console themselves by singing hymns, hoping for change. But for men like Brian Gumbo and Brighton Mudari, this may ultimately be too little, too late.